And last week, what I wanted to do was looking, look particularly just at the words, dikaiosune theu, the righteousness of God. Now, if you weren't here last week, please go back and listen to that because it will be really significant at understanding the rest of the book of Romans. Now, what I said last week concerning the righteousness of God is that you can, it's, it's a broad categorical term. Theologians often want to make it an either or, but when you actually read the sweep of scripture, you see it's a both and. First, the righteousness of God reveals that God remembers his people. When God makes a covenant with his people, for the people to be declared righteous, what do they need to do? They need to keep the covenant. To keep the laws of Moses was to be declared righteous. But we often forget God had made promises to Israel. And again and again throughout the Old Testament, the question is, is God unrighteous? Because it appears he's not keeping his promises. He promised us a land and we're stuck in the slavery of Egypt. And when God enters the scene to liberate his people out of Egypt, it is a declaration that he is righteous. He is good on his promises. Even more so, we see with his son, Jesus Christ, this great promise to liberate his people out of death, out of sin, into life, is a revelation that God is faithful and God will redeem his people. It is the proclamation, God remembers you. But we also saw how the righteousness of God reveals the activity of God to make his people righteous. This is what the reformers understood the righteousness of God to be. It is the activity whereby in Christ Jesus, God takes your sins off of you. So now there's no guilt in you. Now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he lays onto you the righteousness of his son so that now you are declared perfect, spotless, and righteous before your Father in heaven. The righteousness of God also reveals his divine power to make you righteous. Now today what I wanna do is I wanna look at Romans 1, 16 through 17 exegetically. I'd like to unpack the remainder of these two verses. I won't focus on the righteousness of God today because again, spend all last week doing that. But today I wanna to look at how Paul reveals to us what a living Christian looks like. Um, what does a Christian not, who is not flatlined, who is not backsliding, who is not uh, decaying or even remaining stable, but what a living, growing Christian looks like? And first we see that a living Christian responds to shame by turning to Jesus. Second, a living Christian has a growing faith. Faith is meant to compound over time. And finally, a growing Christian lives by faith. And I wanna look at what does that mean? What does it mean to live by faith? So if you would, turn with me to Romans 1, 16 through 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul begins by saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, if we look at Paul's life, and we empathize with him and we think about the internal dialogues that must have been going on in his heart and the external dialogues with people that were in his life, you could understand that he was a person who most likely had a lot of shame heaped upon him. You could imagine him experiencing wild communal shame. Think about it for a moment. Israel is under Roman oppression. The Romans are occupying Israel. Now, the Romans often would conquer a territory and then they would just incorporate you in. They would say, you can keep your gods. We'll just add them to our pantheon of gods. But here was the problems that they kept having with these pesky people called the Jews. They wouldn't do it. I'm reading a book right now about the decline of the Roman empire. Um, and it, it often talks about how, uh, the Romans were the most harsh out of anyone in their empire, which basically 
like was the whole globe, the whole known world at the time. They were the most harsh with the Jews because whether it was in Israel or even in other parts of the empire, they were the one group that was notorious for uprisings and rebellions. So they became wildly heavy-handed with them, even compared to maybe the areas of Gaul, what they would do with barbarians up there and things. So you could imagine the people around Paul, when he starts to say things like, you know, Yahweh does not only want to save Israel, Yahweh also wants to save the Gentiles. That would be read as utter communal betrayal. You are siding with the occupier. You are siding with the people that are killing us. You have betrayed your community. You could also sense or feel a sense of internal betrayal, right? Paul is born again, but that pesky old Adam is always trying to drag us back to himself, isn't he? So Paul lived all of his life seeking to keep the law, finding his value and his worth in law keeping, even to the point of going above and beyond what the law required. And now Christ Jesus has revealed to him, you are saved by grace, not by the law. Could you imagine that inner lawyer in him saying, you've betrayed yourself, you've betrayed yourself, you've betrayed yourself. What were you doing all of those years? They were all a waste, were they? Or you could even think of a theological betrayal. You have to remember that Paul was a theologian of his day. And now his understanding of monotheism has radically changed that God is one and three in persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That God came and dwelt among us. That God died in our place to bring us into life. His professors would have been ashamed of him. His family would have been ashamed of him. His former self would have been ashamed of him. His community would have been ashamed of him. And what does shame always do? It says, come back to the way things were. You changed, and if you just come back, if you just return to the way things were before, all of this rejection can just go away, and we can hit the reset button. And how does Paul respond to this? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. He's saying, how could I ever go back? How could shame work on me? I have found the source. I have found the place of true life. How could I ever go back? His eyes are so fixed on Jesus that the words of accusation and shame fall on deaf ears because he's become, he has been overcome by the glory of his Lord. I asked Andrew to read John chapter six to us today uh, because I think it's, it really fits. If you know John chapter six, at the beginning, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Overnight, he builds a megachurch. But here's the problem. Uh, They like the fact that he provides food for them. They like the fact that uh, he can multiply bread. He appears to be a new Moses, right? He multiplies the bread. He provides for their needs. In the ancient world, that's as good as it could get. But in their minds, though, what they're receiving is a prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospels form megachurches really quick, don't they? But then when Jesus starts preaching the gospel, everything changes. When he begins to say, I am the bread of heaven, that unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, there is no life in you. That he is the one place of eternal life, that while our ancestors grew hungry after eating the bread, if you eat of me, you will never grow hungry again. When they heard those words, what happened to the 5,000? John 6, 60 says this, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? Their eyes began to turn from Jesus. And then in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Shame overcame them. They liked some of what Jesus said. But then when Jesus started preaching the gospel, that salvation is found in him. Well, 
that caused so many to turn and to walk away. And it still does today. We like it when we have Jesus on our terms, but Jesus on his terms, shame so often overtakes us. So Jesus has a question, an understandable question. In verse 67, he says this. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Will shame overtake you as well? Will you turn your back on me as well? And Simon Peter answered him. Simon Peter, the very man who later will have shame overtake him and deny Jesus three times. And Jesus will thrice restore to status. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. This is what Christians are called to do when faced with shame. Shame external to us or shame internal to us. Where can we go? For you have the words of eternal life. This is the exact same thing that Paul is saying. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. What do we do with shame? We turn to Jesus. You know, I just spent the uh, week at Synod. Synod is where pastors go together to sin because we, (laughs) we all drive each other nuts, okay? That's the secret mystery. We all drive each other nuts and we have to just say, forgive me, Lord. Um, But we often talk shop too. And uh, the thing that most of us are facing is what do we do in this age that has weaponized shame so effectively, right? So many of my friends have walked away from the faith. Friends I went to seminary with, friends who wanted to be pastors, Uh, Friends who were raised in the church became resentful towards other Christians. They were told that was a good thing, by the way, because they were told we're better than those other Christians. Bad posture, right? Doesn't fix the heart. Then they became resentful towards Jesus because Jesus doesn't say what they want him to say. And so then they became ashamed of being associated with Jesus, ashamed of being associated with his people, and left the faith. Um, and I've said that rather objectively. You have to know, like, this is, these are like some of the greatest wounds I carry, is seeing my friends walk away from the faith again and again. And the question that we ask ourselves is, how do we respond? Our pastors are always asking this question, how do we respond? How do we respond? Um, and one way you can respond is only by answering the objections people have of, for walking away from the faith. Here's one something I really want to communicate to you. I think we should answer them. Having an answer for the world's questions is important. But if all we do is answer them, what do we do? We form an oppositional posture to the world, and the world's sin sets the agenda, right? Really bad plan. The other option is we just build really strong institutions and build walls to say, well, this is how we're going to like, stay safe from the world, Right? Uh, So we plant Anglican churches, plant Christian schools, et cetera. Things I've given my life to, right? Not wrong in themselves, but that can't be the answer either in itself. The fundamental posture for how we respond to a world bent on shaming those who follow Jesus is to turn our eyes to Jesus. It's that simple and it's that hard. If you want your children to not succumb to the temptations of the world, point them to Jesus. We are creatures of loves. We are creatures of passions, and we are creatures of intellect. Show them the glory of Jesus. Show them the power of the gospel. And that's the starting point for dealing with shame. Because we can proclaim, I'd rather be with Jesus than anywhere else. Where can I go? For he has the words of life. I'm not saying we don't have answers. We must have answers. I'm not saying we don't build institutions. We must build institutions. But our fundamental posture is one of worship and adoration of who Christ Jesus is. That is what will tether our heart to him so that shame falls off of us 
And that is the greatest gift we can give to our children, is showing them an image of Jesus worth following. First, a living Christian deals with shame by looking to life himself. Now, second, let's look at this nature of growing faith. Look at verse 17. For in, the right, for in it, well, let's do 16, 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Now that last saying, from faith for faith, is, is kind of complicated, but I think Luther gets it right. Martin Luther, in his commentary on Romans, is one of the most uh, significant works of the Protestant Reformation. He says this, the words from faith for faith signify that the believer grows in faith more and more. It's a compounding faith over time. Our faith is meant to not stagnate. It is not meant to decline. It is meant to grow. And yet for many of us, we can remember a time when our faith grew. We can remember a time when we were on fire for the Lord, but life or a grief or a loss or whatever it is is caught up with us. And we say, I still have faith. I come to church but I'm not sure my faith is stronger today than it was yesterday. So how does our faith grow? How do we experience a posture of growth over a lifetime? Well, I think it's fitting that this week we start Lent. Lent is a season of intentionality. Lent is a, is a discipleship tool given to the church to turn from the things of this world, and to turn to Jesus. And so here's what I'd like to encourage you, that as your faith grows during Lent, here are three ways that God uses to grow our faith. We're all different. We all have probably different, um, you know, uh, fasts that we're gonna engage in. But here's a way that God grows faith across times and places and countries and everything else. First and foremost, he always chooses to grow our faith through his word. Always through his word. In the beginning, God spoke, creation burst forth. God called to Abraham and formed a people. The logos, the word, came down and dwelt among us to bring us into life, to pronounce you are forgiven, and it is so. And in the in. It, In the future, he will announce, behold, I am making all things new and it will be so. God acts by his word. And if we want to be formed into the image of the word, we need to bask in his word. John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My prayer for you is that Lent would be a time where you re-engage God's word. Do you have a reading plan of some kind? Do you have time each day set aside to just reflect on who God is as he reveals himself in his word? My prayer for you. So, okay, so being an Anglican, here's my experience. Uh, I've met a lot of Anglican people, even evangelicals that become Anglican because they said, I got really tired of Sola Scriptura So I want a Protestant tradition that values the tradition. Guess what? The Anglican tradition believes in sola scriptura. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Doug. It does. We still believe it is the unnormed norms that norms all the other norms. It's, It's the rule of faith. It is what we judge everything against. It is the one that tells the true story of creation, that tells you who you truly are, who God is. How can you know yourself outside of knowing God's word? So please, during Lent, I'm not saying read the whole Bible, but I am encouraging you, take time in his word daily. The second way that God forms from faith for faith is through obedience. Now, I don't talk about this one very often. It's not as much as I should because many of us um, were raised in churches that unintentionally, maybe we heard this, Um, 
because I do think kids misunderstand this a lot. So maybe also give your childhood church a break. Maybe you didn't th- hear what you thought you heard. I went to youth group once and I said, what did I talk about this morning? And I was like, that's not what I said. And you go, youth group kid, you're amazing. You're amazing. I love talking to you. Here's, so many of us have heard, God will love you through your obedience. And so I've been preaching to you for almost 10 years. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. But now I think it's also time for many of you to hear, he loves you and he wants you to follow him. He loves you and you have greater life for you through obedience. We are a reformed church, so we start with identity, but never forget that the Puritans were reformed. An identity leads to repentance, change, and obedience. James Clear wrote a really good book called Atomic Habits. Have any of you ever read Atomic Habits? Yeah, it's a good book, right? Skip buying the book. I'll tell you what it says. These kind of books, you don't need to buy them. Here's what I'll tell Let me buy it for you. Um, he basically says this. Okay, so he has this idea of, of um, keystone habits. And a keystone habit is if you do that habit, all the other habits fall into place throughout the day or become easier. So let's imagine exercise, exercise. So you start the morning and you exercise. What happens? Well, your body like wants better food when you exercise. Have you ever noticed that? right? Um, your, your brain works better. You go to sleep on time because you're actually tired, right? All these things happen, they fall into place. But he also says, hey, bad habits work the same. If you start the morning scrolling, your brain gets wired for immediate, easy dopamine hits that you just go to throughout the rest of the day, right? And I think this is because God made us to be worshiping creatures. Therefore, he made us for habits, that compound, habits that grow over time, but we were meant to adore God more and more and more and more and more. That's why the human brain is so addictive. We were meant to be addicted to the glory of God, but instead we became addicted to the things of this world. But here's what I've noticed in my life. Have you ever noticed that when you say yes to God, you tend to say yes to God? And when you say no to God, you tend to say no. When we start our day saying, Lord, what would you have for me? What obedience is the Spirit prompting me towards? We find ourselves asking that question more and more. Lord, show me how to glorify you in my life today. And conversely, when the prompting of the Spirit is ignored, would you ever notice that little voice that talks to you right before you sin? You know, Holy Spirit, and you ignore his voice? Then we find ourselves days, weeks, months, years later saying, why can't I hear God's voice anymore? And not always, but much of the time, it's because we have consistently and habitually tuned him out. So that when we need to hear his voice, it comes off as a faint whisper we can barely hear. Lent is fundamentally a time to give up that which is good to choose the best thing, to give up good things in your life, to choose time with Jesus. But Lent is also a time of repentance too. Is there a sin in your life that you have just given up on? This is just part of who I am. Lent can also be a time where the Lord can lead you through repentance, lead you through saying yes to him and no to the flesh. Israel, when they were liberated out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, into the wilderness, that 40 years in the wilderness, this is your 40 days of Lent, those 40 years were meant to get Egypt out of them. Before they inherited the promised land, they needed a lot of time to get those old habits out of them. Sadly, they brought Egypt with them. And again and again, this is what we see happening in the promised land of why it goes into chaos again and again, because they brought their sin with them. But so too, Lent is a time where we can say, Lord, where do you need to get Egypt out of me? Where do you, by your strength and your power, want to lead me into repentance? First, we see the word. Second, we see obedience. And finally, we see community. Faith only grows 
and the soil of God's people. Ephesians 4, 15 through 16 says this, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, growing in faith, for whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. How do Christians grow? They grow together. How do Christians live? They live together. This Lent season, here's the word I wanna give you. Don't do it alone. Find a friend or a spouse or a, a, talk to your kids about it. Talk to someone. What does God want to do in your life during Lent? Where is he calling you to grow? The first negation of the Bible Right, So when God creates, it's all good. Good, 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 good. Everything's yes and amen until he sees lonely Adam. The first no of the Bible, the first negation, it is not good for man to be alone. And those words are still true today. So how do we grow? We grow together. How do we grow? We grow in obedience. How do we grow? We grow in the word so that we might grow closer to Jesus. The end, the direction towards which we are oriented is life with our Lord. Now, finally, I wanna look at the verse 17 and then I'll conclude. What does it mean to live by faith? Look at verse 17. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. What does it mean to live by faith? Well, faith has a positive and a negative pull to it. Most of us know what the positive pull is, right? It is a proclamation that Jesus is my only hope of life. If I'm gonna be saved, it's through this one right here. This is the one that will take my sins away. This is the one that will give me his righteousness. This is the one who will bring me into life. It is a firm conviction. This one right here is my only hope. But there's another side to faith, a side to faith that I must admit I had never seen until this past year when a theologian pointed it out while I was reading through these Romans commentaries. Romans 4, 4 through 5, in it, Paul seems to be saying, he is saying, that faith is also a proclamation of something that it isn't. Faith equals not by works. Faith is a proclamation of yes to Jesus and a no to the works of my hands. Look at Romans 4, 4 through 5. Just turn one page over. Now to the one who works, his wages are counted, or his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. The one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, justifies, makes righteous the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Let me read that again. And the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. What is faith in that passage? not by works. It is a negation as much as it is a positive attestation. It is not by the works of my hands that I can be saved, but only through the work of Jesus. It is a turning from the works of my hands, turning to the great gift given to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it means to live by faith, to again and again repent and turn to Jesus, to turn from our desire to build our own identity, to appease God by our actions, to justify ourselves, and to turn to the one who has justified us as a work of grace. Brothers and sisters, it's that simple and it's that hard. Day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out, 
to turn our face from the work of our hands, from the things of this world, and to turn our gaze upon Jesus. This is the posture of Lent, and this is what I hope you experience this Lent season. It's just a season of discipleship, a season of intentional discipleship, to turn from the things of this world, to turn from the works of our hands, and to gaze upon the face of our beautiful Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we are made righteous in you and not by our works. Lord, would we trust in you and in you alone to bring us life. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we glorify you. Jesus, would you be our everything. In your name we pray, amen.